Next on our agenda uh, is our main speaker. Uh, our main speaker is uh, Mr. Mario Fezekas. So I will uh, uh, beam up his uh, I will beam up his his uh, bio uh, for you to uh, to see uh, on your end. Then I will uh, read through uh, as as it is projected. I understand some people normally uh, don't like to read; they just like to listen. So, Mr. Mario Fezekas. Uh, is a certified forensic examiner. Mario Fezikas has over 20 years fraud risk management experience, six of which were at one of the big four firms where he headed up the fraud uh, prevention, where he headed up the fraud prevention and was responsible for fraud, uh, for prevention and detecting fraud in, the, in their largest global internal audit clients. He joined Exactech, exec uh, exec is going to elaborate on that. He joined Exec Tech in January 2008 to create the fraud prevention practice. And then in January 2001, Exec Tech merged with SNG Rand Thornton. Mario brings a wealth of experience to complement and enhance the, uh, the current fraud risk management offerings of SNG Rand Thornton. He is a, like I stated earlier, he is a certified fraud examiner and uh, a training assessor accredited by the Sector Education and Training Authority Center for Finance, Accounting, Management, Consulting, and other financial services uh, uh, facet. So with that said, I would like to welcome Mr. Mario to, the, uh, to make his presentation. I know Mario is a friend of the country of uh, Eswatini. There are things that he has uh, done with us as a country through the ACFE Eswatini chapter. So Mr. Mario Fezekas, you are welcome. You can uh, take over, sir. Thank you, Sibusisu, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As Sibusisu says, I am a friend of the country. I used to love my visits to Eswatini. I think I used to visit at least once or twice a year over the last 10, 15 years. We had started off where I was doing training for your chamber of business and then um, for various organizations, including MTN. I'm just going to share my screen. And I hope the gremlins stay away. There we go. Can you just confirm that you can see the slides and still hear me or see me? We can see the slide. We can hear you right. perfectly. Thanks, Iwasiso. Um, I just want to let you know what, what are the learning objectives of this session. It's to describe the five key principles of the COSO Fraud Risk Management Guide. And then on top of that, to identify 10 what we call plays that it will enable you to implement the COSO fraud risk management principles. And finally, to give you access to supplemental fraud risk management tools that you could use. So basically, um, we're going to have a short <clears throat> introduction. We're then going to look at the phases and plays and then a Q&A session. So how did we get here? Back in 1992, the Committee for Sponsoring Organizations uh, launched its original internal control integrated framework. I don't know if any of you can remember that far back. Then in 2013, it was um, updated. COSA incorporated 17 principles, including a new principle on fraud risk. So the original booklet did not really mention fraud. Not surprising. It's only since we've had Enron and Adelphia and all these big uh, frauds that you've found fraud creeping into ACCA, RA, um, SICA, 
universities, accounting classes. Then in 2016, COSA published a standalone fraud risk management guide. That is the executive summary. If you want the full document, um, this summary is free, the full document, you have to purchase it. One of the challenges we had with this, uh, people had with this guide is that it has a lot of information. And sometimes people struggle with trying to figure out where to get started. So we at Grant Thornton collaborated with the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners to publish this anti-fraud playbook, um, which you can download from the ACFE's website, or I can send it to Notando or Sibu Sisu, who can send it out to everybody. Or you can get it from um, Vusi at our Eswatini office. So back to the 2016 guide. It, there's a lot of information, good information, and it's a very good tool to help organizations establish their fraud risk management uh, program. But if a person is not already a seasoned internal auditor or certified fraud examiner, they won't have the relevant experience to know how to implement the, what, what has been suggested. So in our guide, we try to make it a bit more practical. Especially the principle number eight. So I'm sure you're all aware of the, the old block. You've got your control environment, five parts, risk assessment, your control activities, information and communication, and lastly, your monitoring activities. So we build on that in the playbook. So what we've done, control environment is now fraud risk governance. Just calling it a different name, the principle stays the same. How does the organization establish and communicate its anti-fraud program? Then we look at fraud risk assessment, which is now distinct from your normal risk assessment. Your various control activities uh, to prevent and detect fraud. Then we move on to investigating fraud and correcting the root cause. And then lastly, your fraud risk management monitoring. You know, organizations are dynamic. We need to monitor, is this still working? Are we doing it the right way? Do we need to change anything? So we're gonna move on to the various phase, the five phases and the 10 plays. So there in turquoise are the five phases that we just discussed. And underneath it, each one has got two plays. Practical place. What must we do? Where do we start? Okay, so play number one, under fraud risk governance, where are you? Where do you want to be? Are you starting out at the beginning? Are you in the middle somewhere? And that's why we look at this maturity model as your roadmap. So if I can just blow it up, Start on the left with ad hoc. The words underneath ad hoc talk to them, speak for themselves. Undocumented. Disorganized. Chaotic. That's somebody starting out. Then we go up to initial. Repeat right through to leadership. So you need to, the playbook will give you the prompts to so you can say, where am I in all of this? And remember, some of these elements you may have some of them in repeatable and one or two in initial or managed. You won't be 100% in repeatable, but at least you know where are you generally, 60, 70, 80% of it. And also remember, ladies and gents, not everybody wants to be world-class. When we deal with public sector, most public sector tell us that's for SA breweries, world-class. We're happy to be in managed. Most of the public sector um, that we have dealt with here in South, South Africa, Southern Africa, are sitting in initial and repeatable. That's generally where they are in a, in a traditional maturity matrix. And one or two of them have said to us, we want to be world-class. And I'm saying, but why? What, what will it benefit you? There's nothing wrong with it, but it just puts the goal so far away from you. If you're sitting in initial, your goal should be to get to repeatable. Once you've achieved that sense of achievement, we now say, what's the next goal? 
we want to get you managed. Once you're at managed, you can then decide, are you happy and managed? with actually a very good level, or do you want to get to world-class leadership? Okay, so the trick here is to baseline you. Where are you at the moment? Where do you want to be? Play two, create a culture, an anti-fraud culture. So I'm not going to go through the basics. I'm sure you're all aware of pressure, opportunity, and rationalization, your traditional fraud triangle. Um, for your opportunist fraudster, not your professional fraudster. The fraud, professional fraudster does not re need a reason to defraud you. It's his or her job to defraud you. Okay, so it's the normal employee, pressure, opportunity, rationalization. So you need to counterbalance that with what we call our integrity triangle. Are people responsible? Do they have the authority to do what needs to be done? Are they held accountable when it doesn't happen? And remember, we can't hold people accountable if we haven't given them the tools and training to do what they're supposed to do. And what we found in most organizations, the problem is lack of accountability. Well, people have responsibility. They have authority, but they're not held accountable when they don't do what they're supposed to do. That's one of the big things that's missing. And on the fraud triangle side, what we found is the opportunity side is taken care of. All the controls are in place. But remember, ladies and gents, controls can be overridden. There's something called collusion. What does that do to your controls? That's why you need to focus not just on the opportunity part, but also the pressure and motivation part. Try and help your, your employees, because if you don't help them, they're going to try and help themselves. One of our clients prints money, literally prints money. So... um. What happened was one of the people that, that works on the floor printing these, this currency came to their boss and said, they robbed me. I drew money at the ATM. They robbed me. I can't pay my, my bills. Please, can I have a loan? Sorry, organizational policy. We do not give staff loans. Now, all of a sudden, he's got this huge risk. What does he do? Does he try and alleviate the risk? Does he try and make a plan? Does he try and contact HR and say, we've got a problem? Can we make an exception? Can we loan this person some money to get them through? Should I move him away from printing money? No, he must just go back to his job, which is printing money. So, of course, he helps himself to some money. They catch him and they fire him. Not good. Um, organizations want loyalty. Where's the loyalty in return? It's, it's two ways here. If we want to be seen as a family, we need to be looking out for each other. If somebody gets robbed of their savings or their earnings, it shouldn't just be, oh, sorry, too bad. Go back to, to your work. Play three. Now we're looking at fraud risk assessment under the second principle. We need to think like a fraudster. Especially as, a, as an internal auditor. Remember, I, as the internal auditor, do not do the job. I don't know all the ins and outs and little nuances like the person that's sitting there will know. And that's why it's so important to speak to the people when we are auditing. So many auditors, I pull my hair out. And you can see I've literally done that. I say to them, I, I go looking for them. I find them in a boardroom talking to each other and looking at pieces of paper. And I say to them, that's not how you audit. Yes, you need to look at those pieces of paper. You need to have conversations but with each other. But you also need to speak to your client. That's how you find out what's going on. And say to the person, if you were going to defraud this organization, how would you do it? You work here every day. You'd be surprised what they tell you, ladies and gents, just by asking them that question. Oh, well, if I wanted to um, cheat on my expense claim, I would take my expense claim to my boss at month end. Why? Well, I know at month end he's too busy and he doesn't check the supporting documents like he does the rest of the month. Okay, thank you for telling me that. I wouldn't know that as the auditor. I don't work there. I don't know the habits of the boss. So out of this, you get your what they call a fraud risk map. Your roadmap to, to what are your threats. Fraud risk register. That's what we call it here in Southern Africa. Remember, this booklet was published in the United States. They call it a roadmap, fraud risk map. So here's an example how to think like. 
This is an art exhibition. All those tables, long tables, are called plinths. And they're crowns on each plinth. And the public are going to come in that door on the left and walk in amongst those plinths, observing the crowns. Now, that is, they've got one camera up on the wall, one camera, and there's a security guard outside. When you arrive, the security guard says to you, when you go inside, do not touch anything. There's no signs to remind you. The security guard is it. Do not touch anything there. So, of course, people, that the ladies especially, that are coming to this art exhibition, they want to pick up the crown, put it on their head, and take a selfie. And post it to Instagram. Look at me. I'm a princess. I'm wearing a gold crown, platinum crown. So, ladies and gents, think like a fraudster. Think bad things. What could go wrong here? You want to maybe just let me know or put it in the chat? And again, it's pretty obvious to, to me as a forensic auditor, what could go wrong? You don't need to be a rocket scientist to find, look at that and say, this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. Okay, security guards outside, one camera up, people are going to come in, walk around, looking at the crowns, what could go wrong? Velabanti, Kumalo, thank you. Exchange one crown. No, perfect. Brilliant. Yes. Breakage. Yep. Genuine crown replaced with a fake. I'm glad that's how you're thinking, ladies and gents, because if you don't replace it, they will know straight away it's missing. So the person could come there, photograph the real crown, go and make a polystyrene one, come there with it, with it in their bag or under their arm, under wearing a jacket, stand with their back to the camera, switch the crowns and walk out. The camera won't even know the crown's gone. Great. Notanda, breakage, yes. What about breakage? There's nothing protecting that crown. People are told not to touch. Who's stopping them touching? I don't know if you're aware of this experiment that was done. They painted a park bench and put a sign, wet paint, do not touch, and put up a hidden camera. Nearly 80% of the people that walked past touched. Let's see if it's still wet. Oh, yes, it's wet. We like to test things. That's our nature as human beings. So now you've told me don't touch. What do you think I want to do? I want to touch. Thank you for your input. Let's see what actually happened. Oh, oh, she fell. <gasps> That's what I heard. Oh, I want to see him like right before. She just fell right into it. She's calm in the black. Look at him. The manager has no idea what to do because there's no disaster recovery plan. There's no fraud prevention plan to tell him if this happens, phone this, do this, lock that. Don't let the people touch the crowns. Leave them if they fall on the floor, whatever. So what happened was the lady, they were told don't touch. So she wanted to take a selfie. So she crouched down in front of that plinth to make it look like the crown was on her head. She took a selfie and then leant against the table, the plinth, and the one knocked the other, knocked the other. You had your domino effect. 12 crowns damaged. Boom, just like that. In hindsight, if they did proper risk assessment, they would have seen that could happen. And I'm just reading some of the comments. Yeah. I like that skeptical. That's 
what a lot of auditors are not, ladies and gents, professionally skeptical. I'm talking external and internal auditors. They like the client, they trust the client. One of the big problems. So looking at that, they should have moved the tables further apart. So if one fell, it would not hit the other one. But maybe there's not enough space to move them further apart. So in that case, bolt them down. L brackets, bolt them down. So if you lean against it, it doesn't fall over. Another thing they could have done, put a glass cage over each crown so people cannot physically touch them. Or if it did fall over, it would stay within the cage and have less damage. Or maybe just drill two holes in the table and put a um, cable tie over the crown. So if it did fall over, it would stay in place. So there's a lot of things they could have done, inexpensive things that would have prevented $200,000 damages. People asked, why did you not bolt down those plinths? Answer, people are warned to be cautious. We trust people. Wow. That comes up so often, ladies and gents, when we are investigating fraud and we speak to management. I trusted him. I trusted her. She's been here 34 years. She, he's been here 26 years. Does that mean we can trust a person just because they've been there a certain amount of time? But yes, we are, we are humans and we start liking people, becoming familiar with people. They didn't defraud in the last 24 years, so why will they defraud now? People change. Yes, Pumla, good question. The crowns were not insured because these type of things happen to other people, not us. Same when we speak to management. Well, I don't need to put in an anti-fraud program. I trust my people. Fraud happens to other people. Wow, okay. So, in terms of our fraud risk register, at a minimum, should include information of the department, business unit, the actor, the fraud actor, who could that be? The accountant, the, the financial manager, the CF, who, who, who are we talking about? <clears throat> Where would be the risk entry point? Debtors, creditors, if we're looking at finance, what would the actual fraud scheme be? That is the minimum, but it's too little. We then move over to the right. We need what is the fraud category, fraud type? <clears throat> what are the <clears throat> related controls? Is it internal? Is it external? We need as much information without overdoing it in the fraud risk register. So how do we find out what information to put? Where do we get these categories from in the fraud types? Well, we go to the ACFE's website. There is the URL. It's called the fraud tree. And if any of you are certified fraud examiners or have been exposed to the fraud tree, you'll know there are three categories of occupational fraud. Corruption, asset misappropriation, financial statement fraud. Of course, the, the corruption is a small, in terms of categories, there's only four. Financial statement fraud, there's two with subcategories. The big one is asset misappropriation. So let's take an actual case that happened here in South Africa. There's the newspaper headlines. 32 million rand secret drove mother to suicide. This lady, her name is, was Ronelle. She was the financial manager at Eurocopter. All she did is she's in the accounts payable. So she creates a fake vendor company to be set up on the vendor master file, processes a, a fake contract, approves fake invoices on a monthly basis, for goods or services not received, and then approves the payment. 32 million, what did she do with it? Well, casino, uh, six and a half million rand um, mansion, enough red flags. But anyway, let's go back to the fraud scheme. If we have a look, what did she do? She created a fake supplier and then invoice the company and she would approve the invoices. So it's asset misappropriation. That's the, the fraud scheme. Then what is the fraud category? It's either cash or inventory. In this case, it's cash. Under cash, we've got three options. Theft of cash on hand, petty cash, bank deposit, theft of cash receipts, 
skimming, taking the money before it appears on the books, cash larceny, cash theft, taking the money after it appears on the company's books, or is it fraudulent disbursements, fake billing schemes, uh, fake salary schemes, fake reimbursement schemes, and so on? Well, it's the subcategories fraudulent disbursements because she caused invoices that are fake to be paid. What would the fraud type be? It would be a billing scheme, and in particular, shell company. That is what we need to do. I've seen so many fraud risk registers where it says asset misappropriate. Assets can be misappropriated. That's it. Look how many options there are, ladies and gents. We need to be specific. Then we can manage our risks much, much better. There's an example. We would have the business unit. The examples here are payroll, and then everybody because it's expense reimbursement, the last two. Everybody or most departments would have expenses being incurred and recovered. Then is it internal or external? And what is the general fraud category? The fraud type, scheme, sub-scheme, who's the actor, the entry point? The first two are payroll, the next two would be expense reimbursements. What's the underlying risk? What's the related control activities? Um, in the playbook, it's got uh, various checklists. So how are you going to break down your fraud risk roadmap to include your whole organization? That's the starting point. Identify internal, external. Integrate the identified fraud schemes. Make it as comprehensive as possible. And then constantly update it. Look at it, especially on a quarterly basis. Annual is a bit too long. Every three months, just revisit, revisit. And then play four. We need to discover what we don't know. That's the whole idea of a fraud risk assessment. The purpose, ladies and gents, of a fraud risk assessment is not to find fraud. Data analytics is to find fraud. Fraud risk assessment is to see where the control's not working. On paper, they're here, but when we test them, they're not working. And it shows us where we are most vulnerable to fraud. So it's a holistic view of the controls that are in place and whether they're working or not. Identify, it's taking that iceberg and turning it upside down. Principle eight of the COSA framework, which is the fraud principle, says fraud risk assessments are now considered distinct from general risk assessments. Why did they say that? Because, ladies and gents, when we go to a client and whenever we're doing work, we say to them, have you had any audits done? Can we see the audit reports? Um, have you had any fraud risk assessments done? Have you had any investigations done? We need to understand the business as best we can in order to find out where the hotspots are and the history and have things been fixed. And when they give us the risk assessment document, a PDF or Word document, we start searching in it for words like corruption, kickbacks, theft. And we don't find these words because they've overlooked the fraud risk. They look at currency risk and weather risk and industrial action risk, not fraud risk. And I'm not saying all risk assessments are like that, but many of them are because the risk manager has not been trained in fraud. Hence, he or she's not looking for the fraud risks. And that's why COSA says what it says. So, what is the process? Well, generally, we start with a survey. We survey management, ask them some questions. We then interview people. We will then go, once we've got the surveys back, collated the information, go and interview managers. So, of course, if I'm going to visit the procurement manager, I will have a look, what did he or she say in the survey? And when I go and speak to him or her, I will have in the back of my mind what they said. If they contradict anything, I'll say, but on your survey, you said this, but now you're saying this. Can you just explain? And to have workshops, cross-functional groups. How do you see the risk internal audit? As forensics, we see it as a high risk. How do you see it? Management, how do you see it? And then come up with a consensus. 
So we have buy-in. It's not just, oh, forensic sees it as a risk, but we don't see it as a risk. Let's look at everybody's input. And then even walkthroughs. Before COVID, walkthroughs was the best thing, ladies and gents, because management tells you one thing. When you go to subordinates and say, show me how you do your work, you see they do it differently to how management told you it's supposed to be done or on paper. So now with COVID, walkthroughs are a little bit more challenging. And so that's one of the missing elements at the moment for fraud risk assessments. So that's why we're saying the tip, a mature risk assessment process employs multiple techniques. Some people just do surveys. You're going to get limited information in surveys. Often people put down on surveys what they think you want to hear. I don't want the auditors here snooping around, so I'm not going to tell them where these things are broken. I'm going to tell them everything's fine. You're going to skip that department. But if you interview the person and do a walkthrough or have a workshop, you'll start picking up things. And then as you develop your methodology, um, there's key questions. Who will be on your assessment team? And we found collaborative effort works best. We work with management here as a team to say, we're not here to pick on you. It's not a witch hunt. We're working together to strengthen your processes. We do it on an inherent basis. We don't want to know what the controls are. We are going to show you where all your risks are. You can then give your comments and say, ah, but I've got this in place or that in place. Um, how will you educate stakeholders on the fraud risk assessment process? What are you going to do afterwards? Is it just a report? Are you going to give a feedback session? Uh, are you going to maybe take some video clips of what you found when you did the walkthrough? All of that adds credibility to what you found. Um, what factors should you consider when prioritizing fraud risks? Will this be based solely on likelihood and impact? Or will you look at other things? Like, You can just mute yourselves, ladies and gents. Somebody's not muted. Thank you. What about frequency? How often could 20 Rand be stolen? If 20 Rand can be stolen every second, you could have a problem. And velocity, how quickly could this thing happen? So it's not just a oh, likelihood and impact. We could bring other things into it. No, it's, it just depends on your business. How often are you going to do fraud risk assessments? What will initiate a reassessment? Are you going to wait till there's a fraud? So you're going to do it now and then three years later, oh, we've got a fraud. No, we should be planning to do it. fraud risk assessments maybe every 18 months, not waiting till we have a fraud. As part of the risk scoring process, you should identify existing anti-fraud controls and how effective they are. But remember, ladies and gents, this is the general scenario. When the auditors are there, people are on their best behavior, and they're telling you what they think you want to hear. When you leave, people say, the auditors are gone. Let's relax. Let's go back to how we were doing things. That's why it's very important to combine fraud risk assessments with data analytics. Because data analytics is the auditor when you are not there. CCM, continuous controls monitoring. Monitoring the transactions. Um, when it comes to data analytics, you've got your common frauds going right up to organized crime, attacking businesses. So you start off with your rule-based analytics where you analyzing your master files, comparing your employee master file to your vendor master file and looking for similarities and conflicts of interest. Then you take it a step further. You start analyzing your transaction files and looking for round amounts, duplicate payments, and so on, going right up to predictive analytics, textual analytics, using machine learning, artificial intelligence, 
it's not foolproof, ladies and gentlemen. Don't think, oh, yeah, I'll just stick in artificial intelligence. The human brain still exceeds artificial intelligence in most areas. So it's a combination where the people say to me, which are better, automated controls or manual controls? Both, both. If automated doesn't pick it up, manual hopefully will pick it up and vice versa. Same as, uh, is preventative controls better than detective control? No, yes, preventative controls is more cost effective, but what happens if you can't prevent it? You need the detective control in place. So the segregation of duties would be your preventative control. But if people collude, where's your detective control? Which would be your management reports, for example. Okay, fraud control activities. We're on place six now. Well, this is where we say knowledge is power, and we're looking at training and awareness. Off, a lot of people come to me, don't you just have something off the shelf? I'm saying, why do you want it off the shelf? Oh, because I don't have budget. If I come to you with something that's 15 years old, people are wearing bell bottoms and look like hippies, and it's black and white, and we're talking about Enron, an American accent, Murray and Roberts, you're going to switch off. You need to spend a little bit of money and make something that belongs to you. Incorporate people that are, when people watch it, the video, the induction training, they say, oh, there's so-and-so from accounts. There's so-and-so from payroll. Comes alive. Interactive sessions, role-playing exercises. According to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, um, Organizations that combine training with a hotline had 56% of um, tip-offs coming through their hotline. Those that didn't do any awareness training had only 37% of tips coming through the hotline. Because people didn't understand the hotline, didn't trust the hotline. With training, it makes it come alive. And again, you can download the report to the nations. There is the URL. And um, you can go right back. They've been doing these report to the nations, I think, for the last 20 years. Every two years, they publish a report. And remember, ladies and gents, by having training, it, it, it allows management to communicate its commitment to high ethical standards. So some examples. You could do surveys, survey people. What do they know before training versus what do they know after training? Incorporate in the training the, the st stats that you, that you received. Um, we use Survey Fiesta to do the, the, the surveys. What about industrial theater? Those are three actors that we made use of for, um, for industrial theater for Transnet. We had to train 50,000 employees. We had to go around the country You can have polls, quizzes, critical thinking exercises. Stops people falling asleep. Cartoon characters. There's Lofty. Character that we created for the South African Reserve Bank. It's a cartoon strip underneath them that we did for Eskom. In the training, link your policies, your hotline, your code of ethics. Let people see how it's all interconnected. Infographics that summarize the training. So people have got a takeaway with them that they can refer to. What must I look for? What must I listen for in terms of red flags? What is professional skepticism? Well, it's three things that come together. Make use of videos. We've got videos of whistleblowers, a mafia boss from America, ex-fraudsters. That is Brad Sadler. He defrauded... Um, one of the banks here in South Africa of about 60, 70 million went to jail. He's now a pastor. A lot of these fraudsters become pastors. Um, he's actually a friend of mine. I'm pleased to say he has not gone back to jail. Unlike many of them who have come out of jail, become pastors, and they defrauded the church. You want to go and Google Barry Minko? Been in and out of jail. I think he's third time. 
and get engagement and buy-in. Here's an example. At the bottom of the screen are posters that were done by the different regions. So there's Pretoria North, Bloemfontein, Durban, and Port Elizabeth. They designed those posters. Those are their hotline posters. So when they go, go back from the training to their respective branches, they're not going to put up somebody else's poster. They're going to put up their poster that they have designed. There's your buy-in. There are hotline stats over an 18-month period. We noticed that the course increased three times. We thought, that's strange. Why would the course just go up like that? Is it arbitrary? We went back to our diaries. Every time they went up, we had done some sort of prevent, prevent, prevention initiative, newsletters, surveys, whatever. Training can work, ladies and gents, if it's done properly and not just once off tick the box uh, where the people have been exposed. More regular interactions. 13 years of luxury living. Woman steals 460 million from her boss. What do you do with 460 million? Well, there's some of what she did. 11 luxury vehicles, seven properties, 12 million rand jewelry. That's the lady with her husband. He subsequently died. Her case has still not been finalized. That's four years ago, ladies and gents. It's, it's terrible. So I'm going to show you a little clip. This is the asset forfeiture unit. And they are in her, in her house. And this is the video they're taking. So I don't know if you notice those suitcases, the guy, the camera spent a lot of time on those four suitcases. To me, they are ugly and old fashioned. I would not buy those suitcases, but they are allegedly status symbols. They are Louis Vuitton luggage set that costs 60,000 US dollars. That's 1 million Rand for four cases. So we did training at a company and we showed this video and the cases. And about eight months later, we get a call. Please, can you come in and, and do an investigation for us? And we, we started the investigation and find out that one of the employees that had attended the training remembered those suitcases. And one of the people in finance went to Disneyland and took a selfie at Oatambo Tambo Airport. And we had those cases. And the person said, wow, how can he afford a million rand on a set of luggage? Could be fake, but maybe it's not. I need to report it. And he reported it. Turns out this person was colluding with one of the vendors. The vendors was um, allegedly delivering products which were never being received, but he was authorizing the invoices to be paid. And to the tune of 36 million, I think, of which they were splitting at 50-50. So he ended up with about 16 or 17 million. If it wasn't for the training, he would have gone on for another few years, I suppose. Then we look at the investigation. Does your organization have an investigation protocol how to communicate the investigation, how to capture evidence, how to document the investigation? Who should wit interview witnesses and suspects and so on? When do we start documenting? Do we document at the start of the investigation, halfway through, when we have sufficient evidence? You know, it's those type of things. So that's, that's your foundation. So you receive allegations for fraud, now what? If the organization knows that you're going to do an investigation, they see active, don't try and hide it. It's a deterrence factor to say, I don't want to, the, the guys with the blue jackets on and coming here to um, interview me as a suspect. You also need to decide who's going to be involved in this investigation. Do we need lawyers? Do we need um, computer forensic people? 
digital forensics, what tools do we need? You know, people get confused with this terminology. Computer forensics just refers to imaging of computers. Digital forensics refers to imaging of any device, not necessarily a computer. It could be a cell phone, a printer, memory cards. E-discovery just means analyzing information, information that's readily available. Digital forensics and computer forensics says, well, we're going to try and find hidden and deleted information because that's what many suspects do. They start deleting the evidence, renaming it, hiding it. And then play nine, monitoring activities. We need to um, monitor what we're doing and how we're doing it. And what we found is that there seems to be an over-reliance on process metrics. How many people attended the training? Is that it? What about impact metrics? How effective was the training? Are we seeing a change in behavior? Are more people living the values? Are more people reporting things to the hotline than we were before the training? That's what we should be looking at. Focusing on the outcomes, not the outputs. And using those results to improve going forward. And then lastly, reporting on your progress. What's the point of progressing and nobody knows about it? You need to tell people, look at the strides we are making. Why do you think so many people look down on internal audit? They don't understand internal audit or internal audit doesn't communicate adequately with the rest of the business. I did a, a review of the effectiveness of the internal audit department at an organization. When I interviewed the executive and non-executive directors, I was horrified that most of them had well, about half. Didn't know why internal audit was there. Ah, Politburo, Scorpions, come here, disrupt my business. That's what they thought. And I said to them, when last did the CAE come and do a presentation to you? No, the answer was never. He or she has never done it. All he does is tell me how bad I am at audit committee meetings and how my department's got this wrong with it and that wrong with it. We need diplomacy and tech, ladies and gents, by all means. Tell people what's wrong, but also tell them what's right. Thank you for fixing this and this from last year's audit report. But this year we found this and this. Please will you again fix it. Thanks for your cooperation. So let me give you an example. A friend of mine was the chief audit executive at General Electric. Now GE has got five business units. He was the um, CAE at GE Money. So in the first year that he implemented his anti-fraud strategy, his exposure, General Electric's exposure to fraud in that one business unit was 150 million, of which he detected and prevented 108 million, recovered 10 million, lost 31 million. Right at the bottom is his cost to the business, $4.4 million. That's his department's cost to GE money. So what does he do? He works out his return on investment, 27 to 1. He adds up what was prevented and detected, plus what he recovered, divided by his cost to the business. Let's look at year two. His exposure in the business unit doubled, 334 million, of which he prevented and detected 282 million, recovered 10 million, lost 42 million. Return on investment, 29 to 1. What he prevented and detected added to what he recovered divided by his cost to the business. He's now not seen as a cost center. He's a profit center. Look at his budget now. Doubled. Ladies and gents, his internal audit budget doubled from 4.4 to 10 million. Because the CFO said, you're making me look good. I'm giving you money and you're giving me a return on investment. Instead of just seeing internal audit as this hole where money's just disappearing. Ladies and gents, lastly, the supplemental tools. There is the URL that you can go and visit. You can download the anti-fraud playbook and a fraud risk map template. And there are a few more fraud risk tools that the ACFE is making available. The last two are Excel spreadsheets. It's a risk assessment and follow-up action template, a point of focus document. And then the first two um, are online. So there's the interactive scorecard and a library of anti-fraud data analytics tests. 
That is the fraud, the interactive scorecard. So it looks at the five principles and unpacks each of the five principles and asks you to rate it yourself in terms of green, amber, red. Self-assessment. And then your library of anti-fraud data analytics tests. They look at the three categories, corruption, asset misappropriation, and financial statement fraud. And as an example, if you looked at conflicts of interest, you've got purchasing schemes and sales schemes. You click on purchasing schemes, and there are some of the suggested tests that you would do. Compare purchases by ordering clock for each vendor and product to identify a vendor preferential patterns. Is this vendor favoring one vendor and so on? Each one, you click it and it unpacks it for you. Are there any questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you, Mario. I believe we've uh, reached the end of the presentation. Uh, like Mario has uh, said, uh, this is the time now. It's our, we've reached our Q&A session. So if there are people who have uh, questions that they would want some clarity on, you can feel free. However, uh, before we go there, there are a few questions that I noted on the chat box, uh, ones which were in particular directed to Mario. So I will try and read uh, those that were directed to Mario. Then we can go through the rest. The first one goes, Mario, is it only interviews and walkthroughs that help or is it, uh, is it very important for the auditor to have gone through documents like relevant uh, procedure manuals, legislation, job descriptions, etc.? Uh, probably you can take that uh, first, Mario, then we can move on to the rest. Um, no, it, it's interviews and walkthroughs in conjunction with reading, perusing documents, procedures, and understanding the legislation. What does the legislation require? What does the um, guidelines and procedures say should be done? That must be done in conjunction with that. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for that, Maria. Uh, yes, I uh, will then invite uh, the team. Uh, I forgot to introduce the team that we work with uh, as an Institute of Internal Auditors, Swatini uh, region. We have a team of board members. Uh, there is uh, Miss Notando Lamini, the chair lady. There is uh, Mr. Linda Mkwanazi, the treasurer. There is uh, Sibusiso Tito Lamin, the secretary. Then we've got uh, ex official chair, uh, Mandla Chabalala. We've got additional members in the name of uh, Mr. Bryden Hosley and Linda Lamin. So I will also request from the members of the, uh, the committee uh, to help facilitate the QA session uh, if we still have time or if time still permits on Mario's side. So mm, Notando, I don't know if you're still here or Mpumzeni. Uh, you can help. I see that you've, um, Mpumzeni has been trying to answer a few questions on the chat box, but probably I would start with him because he's been trying to give elaborate answers. Uh, I mean, so that he can give elaborate answers on what he was trying to, to do. Mr. Mpumzeni. All right, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Tito. Uh, uh, thank you, Mario, for that uh, insightful presentation as always. I think, Tito, um, uh, in the interest of time, uh, unless, of course, uh, our colleagues and members, they've got um, uh, further, uh, you know, um, follow up questions on the responses. I, I think, in the interest of time, let me just not expand on, on, on any of them. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bukele. Uh, to the rest of the delegates, are there any questions that you probably, or clarities that you probably would like Mario to share uh, before we end our session today? Uh, while uh, we await the hands, or raising of hands, I should also state that uh, as stated in Mario's bio, that he's a training assessor or a qualified uh, examiner. So 
I hope I am not uh, wrong to say that uh, Mario is uh, available uh, to help the various organizations. I'm so pleased that there are uh, organizations from uh, different spheres of industries. So I hope and I do think that uh, we can benefit with uh, Mario's expertise. So Mario is available, I understand, to work with anybody when approached. Uh, so we will ask uh, from Mario to share his pers personal information so that whosoever needs uh, to use him, be it training at organizational level or whatever sector that you would need him for, uh, will uh, uh, surely share that. Oh, perfect, he's done that. Uh, yes, we've got two hands. Uh, I saw there's uh, Mr. Bryden Hosley who went first, then there's Mr. Lukele Mpumzen uh, second. Can I take you in that order, Mr. Hosley? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just a quick one, Mario. Uh, based on work that you've done previously in helping organizations, um, did your work also involve helping organizations to set up fraud programs? Because I, I have noted in some of the organization we are struggling on that and we normally have a policy that talks about fraud. I think that's where it ends. But having an active program in the organization, I think that's what, what we lack. Uh, maybe are your services available around that area? So Bryden, yes. Thanks for the question, Bryden. Yes, um, what we found is organizations, it's, it's human nature. We want a quick fix. Ah, if I do this, I'm, I'm covered. But it's it's a program, as you said. And what we found is many organizations don't have that implementation plan. So what must I do this quarter, next quarter, next quarter, end of the year, plan the next year? It's Fraudsters are dynamic and they're changing their modus operandi. And what I've found is many organizations are doing the investigation, disciplining the person, the, the culprit, prosecuting them, but not addressing the root cause, which leaves them vulnerable now to the next employee that's going to come in and defraud them because they got the same root cause that's sitting there festering, waiting to be taken advantage of. So yeah, I agree with you 100%. Organizations are doing these one-off things, one-off training, tick the box, we're okay for the next five years. We did data analytics, we're okay for the next 10 years. No, it needs to be ongoing. It's very important. Uh, Mr. Lukele, I think you are up next. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, 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 Mario, I think for me, um, maybe, uh, you know, taking into account also what the chat, um, to Richard, yes, the presentation will be availed um, um, to those in attendance. I think if you can link with the <clears throat> say so and leave your email address then, um, which goes to Linda as well. And then Mario, there is a question from Swazi that I will share my perspective um, and then ask you a question. So Swazi is saying, does the IIA SWAT have a whistleblowers policy that protects fraud whistleblowers in SWAT? Uh, the shorter version to that, Swazi, is no. It is not the responsibility of the institute to have a whistleblower policy for the, I mean, safeguarding uh, fraudsters. It is the responsibility of each and every organization to have one. What we can do as an organization or as an IIA is to actually facilitate the best practice and share with our members uh, with the aim that it will help you to then customize to um, uh, your your organization because remember hosting or rather a uh, protection comes at a cost Mario will agree with me that it is not just only you know what exists on paper there's a financial uh, cost involved in that so it cannot probably sit at the IIA but we can definitely help to facilitate in terms of sharing best practice what uh, <clears throat> each uh, organizations can actually include in their respective uh, whistleblower policies. Uh, I don't know whether Mario, you've got a reaction on that before I ask my question. Thanks, Mpumzeni, yes. Uh, even in South Africa, there's no hotline at the RA. but what Claudel, the previous CEO of the RA South Africa did, 
is she set up a anti-intimidation and ethical practices forum, which is a NGO that is there to try and protect members of the RA, ACFE, IMSA, SICA, IOD, that are being intimidated. So keep that in mind. There's also Corruption Watch. There's also ODAC, Open Democracy Advice Center. So there's at least three organizations that you can turn to for advice or help if you are being victimized. Because there is a lot of victimization, ladies and gents. I mean, you would have heard and seen in the news that a few whistleblowers have been killed here in South Africa. It's, it's the minority, but nobody wants to be that whistleblower. You know, there's, there must be hundreds of whistleblowers. And we know a lot of them, they're still alive. But there's a few that are not alive. So as auditors, we have a responsibility. The standards say if we see something, we can't keep quiet. We need to tell somebody. It's our duty. All employees have that duty, the employee-employee relationship. If I see somebody setting fire to the curtains in the office, I can't ignore it and say, oh, it's not my office. I have a duty to not rugby tackle the person, but at least go to security, phone them, security, second floor, somebody's lighting a fire. That's my duty to at least do something. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mario. Um, then my question, Mario, I think, um, um, you know, on a general note, um, please share your perspective um, uh, around the importance of having different um, skill sets in our teams. When I'm saying in our teams, I'm, I'm basically talking about the organization because if, if we, you know, my experience, Mario, is that we tend to uh, have what I call the old day of hiring. You know, um, if you're looking for someone, in, for instance, who is a, a CFE, you know, we, we then go and tailor the, the, the adverts to that effect to say, I want a CFE. Yet internally already, you've got about two, three, four CFEs. You are, lack, you are lacking probably a person with a strong IT background. Can you just please share your perspective uh, probably to the broader members in terms of how important it is before you go out there uh, to advertise, you need to know the deficiencies within your current skill set so that you then go and get what you want. And I think also your, your view in terms of um, how important it is um, uh, to understand that nowadays it's no longer about you know, how qualified you are in that space, but it, it, it's always um, bordering around your agility. I mean, you can have someone who is very strong uh, degree in communication being part of the team, because like, I, like you said, it is very important um, to have a report that will speak directly to what we found on the ground. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, you need a, a, a mix of skills. So if you look at the, the forensic department that I came from when I was at the big four, we had 150 people in the department and there was a mixture of ex-police officers who know how to interview witnesses and suspects and take statements and defend themselves. We had lawyers, we have got accountants, um, we've got IT people. So you need to know what is missing. A CFE is a very general certification. So I'm a certified fraud examiner. So I'm a generalist. I know a little bit about most things. I specialize in training. That's my area of specialty. But where are, you need people that do data analytics. Um, you need people that know digital forensics. They're two very different things. E-discovery, legal. So I agree with you. You need to know what is missing in the department and then go and look for those skills. Not just say CFE. It's the same when companies go request for tender. They just put there, must be a CFE. That's the start. What else is involved besides being a CFE? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mario. Um, Pumzen, was, was there a follow up? No, 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 of course. Thank you. I'm okay. Thank you, Mario. All right. Thanks, Thank you Pumzen. so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mario, for your wonderful presentation and your the insights that you've shared. Like I mentioned, that we have uh, it's not only internal auditors that are present here as delegates, but we've got people from various departments. So, and I'm pleased that uh, at least they understand now uh, the perspective that we come from as and when we conduct our audit work. So, with that said. 
I would want to, uh, I know that it's been said on the chat box and uh, the chapter, chapter lady uh, did mention it uh, at the beginning of the presentation, but as the Internal Auditors, uh, Institute of Internal Auditors, uh, Swatini, we are, uh, will be again hosting another event uh, which will be on the 2nd of December, if I'm not mistaken. So what I will do, uh, they, they, there is already an advert out. Uh, we took it out with the Institute, with the Institute of uh, Internal Auditors South Africa to share with uh, our members. So I will share with you the advert. However, we'll be sending out uh, emails uh, or a, a similar approach that we we did uh, today. So it came out as a date. I don't know if it can it can uh, be on your side. Yes, we can see it. Yes, so there is that uh, event that we will be hosting virtually. Again, it is free. We as internal, I mean, Institute, we are trying to uh, sensitize our, our members and as well as non-members as much as we can about the uh, risks which are out there, uh, the weaknesses that are out there. Probably there might be weaknesses in the ethics and leadership uh, sector. Probably it's the fraud or whatever. But this is uh, one way we, as an institute, are trying to reach out to the uh, professionals out there. Uh, this is not the first and the last. Uh, we are hoping to do more. I should also say that as a, as, a, as, as a committee, we did come up with a strategic plan that we were hoping to uh, unveil last year. Unfortunately, the, the, pandemic happened, I mean, the pandemic happened, so we couldn't. But uh, we are hoping now things are starting to, to ease up a bit, so we will go back and do that. With that said, I would love to uh, put this back to the chair lady, uh, Ms. Notando Lamini, uh, for her vote of thanks and uh, her closing remarks. I thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mkosi. Thank you for um, being an excellent MC for this event. Uh, I think for me, mine is just to pass my gratitude to our guests for such an informative session today. And thank you to all the auditors that were able to attend the webinar, including our partners. I hope each one of us um, will at least take one lesson and implement it. Um, Tito has spoken about the 2nd of December. It's free for all our members. Uh, I don't know from the executive it's if it's going to be free for non-members, but they are going to be invited. I think that the, the details will come. There is also a survey that as the Institute, we are preparing that we are going to send through to our members. We are trying to identify training sessions that we can have for the year 2022. So we'll be sending you a list of courses. It's a survey where you'll be able to select the most needed uh, skills so that we're able to arrange and advise you as early as we possibly can. So lastly, I just want to thank the board of the IIASD for making this uh, session a, a success. I know we needed to push at some point. Yeah, we needed to believe it's going to be real. Thank you very much. Salute to all of you. Uh, I think at this point, also, I'd like to appreciate all of us for just being uh, patient. We did not anticipate that this will take this, this, this long, but I think it was an informative session. It, it was worth all the time. Uh, I think at this point, uh, we need to call it a day. Uh, have a lovely day and be blessed. Thank you.